Lift us, we pray, O Lord, to your presence, where we may be still and know that you are God. Amen. This morning's reading from the 14th chapter of St. John's Gospel is without a doubt one of my favorite readings. Indeed, it is the Gospel lesson that I've chosen to be read at my funeral someday in the far distant future when it's needed. I can remember hearing it read as a teenager at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Houston, Texas, where our family attended. St. Andrew's had been the family church for at least three generations and was comfortable for me. It was a place that I always remember going to when I was a child. It must have occurred during that period in the Episcopal Church when we were going through the trial liturgies. Remember the trial liturgies? First there were the pamphlets, and then there was the green book, and then there was the zebra book, and then there was the proposed book of common prayer, and finally we adopted the book of common prayer that we use this day. For those of you who were not Episcopalians at that time and have no idea what I'm talking about, in the late 1950s, in the 60s, and in the 70s, the Episcopal Church decided it was time to once again revise our Book of Common Prayer. Until that moment, we were using the 1928 Book of Common Prayer, a prayer book that was based very much on the 1662 prayer book used in the Anglican Church, a prayer book written by Cramner and his associates, a prayer book that, for the first time, really brought together a worship service book that the people could have and could use. Church leaders decided that we needed a prayer book in our own language. We did not speak Elizabethan English. We did not embrace Elizabethan ideals. It was time for us to go back and once again come up with something that was couched in images that we could use and we could understand. As a result of these um, 25 years of work, a new prayer book was indeed put forth, the book that we currently have in our pews, a book that in many ways was a compromise of those who wanted to keep the tradition that had been so much a part of our church from its very founding, and those who wanted to move into the future and come forth with a prayer book that reflected the Episcopal Church of the 1970s and more likely our present day. And so suddenly, one morning in church, I heard this lesson being read. Now, I knew in my heart that there was a heaven, and I knew that in heaven God had a special place for all people who followed him, who believed in him, who loved and served him. And so as I sat in the pew that morning, listening to Father Austinson read the lesson, I suddenly had a vision, an image of God's house. It was a great, big, long, three-story, red brick building with a slate roof on it. The facade was filled with large windows that let in a lot of light into the rooms that were behind them. Across the top of the slate roof, there were dormers with yet more windows letting light into rooms. There was a large, curved, white stone driveway, or probably more accurately a walkway, because I don't believe that there are cars in heaven, that swept past a large front porch. The front porch was framed with white, Doric columns and had a huge door behind it. The door was open. There was light spilling out. There was laughter and voices and conversation that could be heard. And there was God standing on the porch welcoming people in and telling them to go and take a place at his table. It was a welcoming place. It was a warm place place. And as I stood there on the gravel driveway, looking at 
this house that I knew was God's house. I knew that it was not my time to enter. I knew that my parents had and that they were inside. I knew that my Uncle David was there. My grandfather was there. My great-grandmother was there. All the ancestors that I had known and who died were in at that party at that table. And I knew that someday, when it was my time, I would enter that great and wonderful house and I would find my own special room there. Maybe it was a daydream. Maybe it was a vision. I don't know. And as I said last week, Jesus always spoke to the people using words and images that the people could hear, could grasp and understand. And so if it indeed was a vision that I had that morning, God gave me that vision using images of love, warmth, comfort, home, that I could understand, that my 13-year-old mind could wrap its brain around. And it was a place that I knew I wanted to be when the time was right. Today, we are living in a time of great fear. Not in 75 years since the time during World War II has the world known the kind of fear that we are experiencing now. We fear catching the virus. Who will get sick? Who will die? Will it be someone close to me? Will it be a distant member that their death doesn't really affect our lives? Will I get sick? And will I die? We fear financial ruin. Will the pandemic force the business I work for to close and suddenly at age 56 I will find myself unemployed with skills that are no longer relevant to the world today? Will it force my personal private business that I've sunk everything into, blood, sweat, tears, countless hours of energy, will it force that business to close and force me to fire all my staff? Will it take my business from me? Financially, will I lose everything? Will I lose my house, my savings, my standing in the community, all the money I've sunk into a business that I loved and had faith in? These are the questions that so many people are answering this day. Anybody looked at their investments lately? How's your 401k looking these days? Are you going to have to put off retirement for a bit longer because suddenly the nest egg you built doesn't look like it's going to be enough? People are out of work. Businesses are shut down. People who, in the best of times, were living from paycheck to paycheck. What little savings they might have been able to put away for a big expense or perhaps a long-awaited vacation are now all gone. The mortgage is now due. The rent is now due. The credit cards need to be paid. Groceries need to be purchased. And the money is not there. People are living in the most non-relenting, fearful time that they've ever experienced. They get up in the morning and fear is pressing upon them. Throughout the day, Every waking second, fear is there. They go to bed at night exhausted and suffocated by fear, knowing that what sleep they get will never be as peaceful because that fear is always there. And they get up the next morning with fear and start the day over. 
This is indeed the most fearful time most of us have ever experienced. It is no wonder that we are drained and depressed. But you and I have the good news if we but believe it and accept it. Believe in Jesus. We have the love of God all around us. It is there to support us and to sustain us, especially, especially in times like these that we are currently living in. Do not be troubled. Have no fear. Believe in God. Believe in the love of Jesus. God has a plan for us, and he has a place in that plan. When the trials of this life are past, we are promised a place in heaven with God. That's God's desire for us to be with him, for us to depend on him, to count on him, to know that God wants what is best for us. So many people want proof of God and of his love. Jesus makes it clear when he says to Philip that the proof is right before your eyes. We can see God throughout the world if we only open our eyes and look carefully. God can be found in all of creation. He can be found in the faces and the actions of the people who are around us. God is present every time a person does something to help alleviate the pain and the suffering and the fear of somebody near them. Sometimes it's somebody we know. Sometimes it's a total stranger. One need only to watch the news every night to see again and again the actions of countless people who are doing everything in their power to help those in need. They're bringing groceries. They're helping to give groceries out. They're making masks. They're making shields for health care workers. They're doing so much with what they have to help others. That is the presence of God in the world today. During this time of fear and great unsettledness in our lives, ever-changing events, you and I have been told where to go for the comfort and the strength that we need. Jesus makes it abundantly clear that you and I are safe in God's love and care. That there is a special place that is prepared, prepared for us. That we are shown how to reach God and all the blessings that God desires us to enjoy. All we have to do is turn to God, accept God, and walk in His ways. We have the greatest example before us, that of Jesus. He showed us what to do and how to live. If we do that, we will experience God's powerful love, and that love will cast out all fear. Will it be easy for us? Will it take away all fear from us at all times? No. We are human after all, but it will help us every night when we go to bed. If we give our lives to God and say, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring God, but please give me strength. And when we get up in the morning to thank God for a good night's rest and to say the day stands before me, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I trust in you, God, to be there for me. 
If we do that, we will indeed find out that our fear is lessened and that our hope and trust in the future, whatever it may be, however long it may be, will be safe and secure because it is in God's hands. Let us put aside fear and walk in God's love. Amen.